Awesome. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Um, we do these sessions ev live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, um, but they are recorded, so if you're unable to join us live on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go and look at all of our recordings on our website and watch any of those. Um, and we do a mixture of things here. We do presentations, interviews, mini training sessions, anything that has to do with libraries, we'll put it on the show, pretty much. <laughs> and we have commission staff that do um, presentations for us here, but we also bring in guest speakers, as we have this morning. Um, and we actually have the um, beginning of a series <laughs> of presentations um, on digital preservation. This is part one. Um, we have Karen Keir, is that how you pronounce that? Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who is um, from the Nebraska State Historical Society, yes. who has um, taken training in using this Library of Congress software, or this... Um, it's a model, model. so mm -hmm. yeah. And so she's going to take us through in a three-part series on how to use this to do digital preservation at your own library or historical society or museum or wherever you're mm -hmm. going to use it. And this is the first one, um, and we're doing today about the inventory and selection modules mm -hmm. of it. And our next two will be on February 20th for um, storage and protection, and March 6th is the final one on managing and providing access to um, your 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 uh, collection once you get it out there. Great. Right. Pretty much. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I am going to hand over control to Karen here. Let's see. Here's the mouse. Thank and you. she can take it away. Thank you. Um, uh, as Krista said, I am Karen Keir, and I am the photograph curator at the Nebraska State Historical Society. But I'm also in charge of the, um, the Society's Digital Imaging Lab. Um, so we've been creating uh, digital imaging, digital data for um, something like 13 or 14 years. So this is really about how to manage all of your digital content, um, whether it be something you've created or um, born digital items as well. Um, so we all know how complicated that can be. So what the uh, library, uh, the Library of Congress tried to do is give you a develop this model or this these modules to help you break it down into doable mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, parts and and uh, go through that. So today's program, we're going to talk about we're going to do some introductions and I'm going to talk to you about what actual digital content is and digital preservation is, um, and then what we hope to get out of this three part workshop. Um, and then we'll move on to the identify module as well as the select module. Um, the, uh, we are sponsored in part by the Husker Heritage Network, which is a new training of opportunities for collection caretakers um, that will help with emergency preparedness, planning, um, and care of paper materials. Um, it's still in the planning session, so uh, hopefully we'll have more information to come in the near future. Um, and until then, please visit our website at nebraskahistory.org slash connect. Um, you can also go to savingtreasures.org um, for um, a lot of great information on how to take care of your physical collections. But today we're going to talk about uh, taking care of your digital um, collections. So what this program is, is the Library of Congress um, is trying to get out as much information as possible. So what they've decided what to do was create these workshops in several different regions and select um, people from um, each state and then send these people, train these people from each state and then send them back to do programs like this. Um, and this is uh, the group that we were, I, I was sent to uh, Indianapolis, which by the way is a beautiful city. Um, and the, the training happened at their library, uh, their state library there. So we're standing on these beautiful steps of their state library. And there was 22 of us in the Midwest region um, so there are 22 other trainers out there that um, you can find in your area that are also resources um, for so you as well as me. multiple people from state, different states. Yes, I'm the only one here that was trained from Nebraska, okay. um, but there was a couple in Iowa, several from Minnesota, um, South Dakota, North Dakota, all over there, all over. 
Um, as well as all over the country. This was just one of the, right. the, the regions. So they did to this other areas of the country. Too. Yes. So if you're not from the Midwest, you've got your own people, too. <laughs> right, which is a really smart way to do it because mm -hmm. now they, they trained us, gave us the information, and sent us back so that we can disseminate the, their information. So know that there is lots of information out there for you. So the depot's mission yeah, is um, is of the digitization depot, which is the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Program of the Library of Congress, is to foster a national outreach um, and education to encourage individuals and organizations to actively preserve their digital content, building on a collaborative network of instructors, contributors, and institutional partners. Um, so basically what they're saying is, it's a big job, and you might not be able to do it alone. So uh, they encourage you to go out there and work together. Um, I know that um, in my past life that uh, I worked with the Library Commission and uh, with the Western Trails or, uh, Digitization oh, yeah. Project. Mm -hmm. That was a while ago. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also we worked with the, the Nebraska Memories um, website mm -hmm. as well. Um, and we put all this great information out there, and we're just talking about how now we need to make sure that this digital information is going to be available and in for the future. Um, and also, I think we had the, the Historical Society before I got there. It worked with the collaborative projects with UNL, for like the um, Willa Cather archives, and um, several other wonderful projects. So um, what this workshop is not going to be covering, we're not going to talk about digitization. Um, and I know when I went to the, the workshop, I had certain expecta expectations um, about what the workshop was going to cover. Um, and I was a little disappointed. Uh, but then I realized just how important the information that they were giving me was um, so that I could go back and really talk to my um, colleagues and say, you know, we're not thinking about this and we really need to be. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, digitize, uh, digital preservation is sort of like a moving target. Your needs are going to change, and the software solutions are going to change as well. But the principles behind digital uh, preservation will stay the same. Um, now, I know not everybody is working with digital objects, um, and, and you may not be collecting born digital items, um, or you might not be doing digital imaging. Uh, but, or you might not even have plans for doing that in the future. However, I still think this is going to be useful because at some point in the future, you will be talking about this. It will become more and more important as we move forward. So what is digital preservation? Um, it's an active management of the digital content over time to ensure an ongoing, ongoing access. Once a physical item is digitized or a digital item or a digital item is created, you can't just put it on a shelf and expect that it's going to still be accessible in 50 years. Mm -hmm. We're used to working with our physical co co um, collections, um, whether it be a, a book in the library or, for me, a photograph. I know that if I do everything right and I preserve that photograph correctly, there should still be a photograph there 50 years from now um, or a book 50 years from now. However, you can't guarantee that if you create this wonderful, helpful Word document mm -hmm. today, that you're still going to be able to open and access that Word document in 50 years, or even in 10 years. Yeah. Um, so what we're talking about today is how are we going to make sure that we are um, going to be able to continue to access that digital information um, and that digital content over time. And digital preservation, it's been called a lot of different things, um, digital curation, digital stewardship. Um, but for the most part, what we're talking about is a set of activities aimed towards ensuring that the access to digital materials is going to continue over time. Um, and here in the United States, most of the time what we talk about is, is that it's the life cycle management of digital materials from the point of its creation on. Digital content is very fragile, and it requires um, care and preservation to preserve them. Um, it 
also, we're also trying to develop a term, uh, it also depends on the technology that's available, whether it be digital forms or the media as media becomes obsolete. Um, digital requirement requires active management to make sure that it's, uh, to ensure that it's uh, uh, accessible as you move forward in, the, um, in its lifetime. Um, but that also means that you're responsible for that and you're, insur you're responsible for insurance in creating those policies that will continue to make sure that they're accessible. Um, and also there is some like legal information too, like um, I know as we manage the state governments, we are legally mandated that we have to preserve those records True. into the future too. And also, I mean, as I take in donor information, I'm making a commitment to my donors that they're going to be there in the future as well. I have the same slide twice, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm going backwards, aren't I? There we go. That's why I have the same slide <laughs> twice. I'm going backwards. Okay. So what the depot created is this baseline module, and they break it up into six different parts. Today we're going to talk about how to identify your digital content, and then we're going to talk about how to select your digital content, because we know not everything needs to be preserved. So it's deciding on what is the most important thing and what needs to be kept and preserved for into the long term. Um, and then on uh, February 20th, we'll talk about store and protect. Um, and Protect will cover some um, information about uh, um, disaster management mm -hmm. and um, we're talking disaster management, everything from tornadoes here in Nebraska mm -hmm. to um, what do you do if your what do you do if your server fails? Mm -hmm. And how do you protect it from that kind of uh, as well? And then on March 6th, we'll talk about uh, managing and um, your, the data content over time and then providing access because we can do all this preservation things, but it still doesn't mean anything if nobody has access to it. So, I keep going backwards here. Okay, so. We can think of these things as building from the center out. One encompasses the next. Identify and select are in the center um, because uh, it helps us identify new and additional content and then select the portions to preserve. Then we're going to store it. What we've selected and I, we've identified and selected as important information. Store it, protect it, manage it, and then provide it. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, the objectives of the, these three uh, workshops is to provide an overview of digital content management stages, suggest concrete, concrete steps so that you can um, take each, uh, concrete steps for each of these stages, help you identify specific um, what will help you move to the next step, and then re uh, recommend additional sources where you can consult after the workshop. And I believe right. we'll be we'll posting have, yeah. those online. Yeah, um, Karen has a Word document that has a whole bunch of information on it that will be included when we put the recording up. Yes. All right. So let's talk about um, identify. So why do we identify content? Con um, content? Well, it's important to do this first because preservation requires an implicit commitment of resources, and we all know resources are tight, you know, whether those resources be monetary or just um, with staff. Um, you have to be able to plan ahead. If you, you can't plan ahead if you don't know how much content you're going to reserve. Now, if you're scanning your entire photograph collection, it might that might be um, content you that uh, you want to plan to preserve. But there also might be digital content that you don't think that is worthwhile to expand um, that effort to preserve. Um, an example of that is when I create a digital image, we create a high resolution TIFF image, and that's our master image. And that's what I want to focus on preserving and collecting. But to make them easily accessible for our staff 
and for our visitors, we often create derivative images, lower resolution images, um, JPEG images that we can email to the exhibits coordinator who's in a panic, I need a photo of. Um, and uh, those things are not something that I'm interested in preserving. It's still digital content on our server, but we're not talking about long-term um, preservation for that. That's the high-res ones are for. The high-res ones we're going to keep and plan and preserve and we're going to focus our efforts on, whereas the, 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 the JPEG ones are still helpful, but we don't want to focus our efforts or our resources on, on preserving. Uh, but there also might be digital content that you don't think about, um, don't think is worthwhile to expand that. Um, so having this inventory, inventory is the best way to identify that content. Good preservation decisions are based on understanding the possibility, possible content to preserve. So you need to ask yourself, what content do I have? Will I have? May I have? Shall I have? Must I have? Or could I have? So we're talking about what do I already have? What will be created in the future? What could be given to me? And what is um, by law mandated that will come to me? Um, the Identify module addresses the need to adjust the scope of responsibility of digital content so that we can understand what is possible in the scope of long-term management. The scope includes digital content that might currently be in the custody of the Cultural Heritage Institution, as well as the digital content that has been created um, by producers of, of, of digital content over time. Uh, if the digital content is retained for um, more than five years, some, some um, type of long-term management is going to be required to make sure that it's accessible when needed. Okay. So the most important aspect of an inventory is that it just exists. Um, you know, the format should be easy to manage. It should be, um, you should be able to document what, what's in the inventory. It should be usable. It should be available, which means um, not just sitting on somebody's hard drive, one person's hard drive. Um, it should be scalable so that if you just want to look at the um, databases, you can pull up just the databases, or if you want to look just at the digital images, you look just at the digital images. And it should be a, um, a it should never be static. It should be updated um, continuously and, um, and periodically uh, whenever you make changes to your inventory. An inventory can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet on the server, a Microsoft do uh, Word document, um, a Google, Google document, or some sort of shared um, online cloud uh, document is a great way to do it as well. Um, I know that uh, a lot of uh, the, the depot people are using Dropbox, which we found to be oh, a great mm -hmm. way to yeah. share information back and forth. And We've used that here, yeah. yeah. Very easy. Mm -hmm. So basically anything that whatever as a, as a, whatever you guys are familiar with and it works easiest for your staff, you can go with. You exactly. You use something in particular. No, nope, there's, you know, this is just an, an inventory and this is for your internal purposes. So whatever is going to work at, best for you. You don't need big fancy software. Um, so, the, uh, what, so what should an inventory include? It should be... Um, a list of content that you already are preserving, other digital content that should be preserved, any new content um, that you're preserving. Oops, sorry. This one in there twice. Uh, as well as um, anything that you're creating, content that may require, that you're maybe required to keep, such as retention schedules require you to keep, um, as well as content that needs to be reviewed. Um, use available and um, familiar software uh, so that you can get soft what uh, so you can get started as soon as possible use software tools that um, you already have um, 
free and easy uh, open source and tools are, are um, out there and easy, easy for you to use. Just be consistent, comprehensive, and concise. The level of detail, um, inventory will depend on you. Um, but uh, And you can determine the appropriate and less level for yourselves. Um, the extent of comment, think about the, the extent of the content you're going to be inventory, the nature and location of the content, that's, uh, as well as the resources available to complete this inventory. Um, we're all under timelines and deadlines, so you, know, you may have to just do a simple survey if you're under a short timeline, or you can maybe take some more time to do a comprehensive one as well. So a, a simple one. Um, should just be the, what type of content it is, whether it's an image, video, website, or document, what format is it, um, the date that it was created, and we'll talk more about the importance of noting the date later on, as well as the location of it. So here's a really simplified inventory example. Um, it just says what kind of category it is, the title and description, the creation date, um, the location and the extent, um, as well as the format. If you want to get more complex, you may want to uh, think about copyright considerations, what operating system is required to read that file, um, the software program needed to read that file, and what tools are available to help you determine that file, to open that file format. Um, here's an example from ARMA of a more complicated um, serv uh, in inventory form. Um, you'll see that it has all of those and much, much more. Um, and if you want to see that ARMA survey, here's a link to it, um, as well as another link to the California Digital Library, um, their inventory as well. We'll include all those links afterwards as well. So you don't have to try and scribble down that huge long URL. Sorry. Um, no, and then I go okay. ride really fast too, yeah, right? That's actually fine because um, as we do with all of our shows, we um, put all of these links into the commission's delicious account. So everything that she's showing here and linking to, you'll have access to afterwards, no problem. Okay. So your inventory should um, contain all that is relevant. And everybody is going to have different types of um, of relevant data, whether it be institutional records, special collections, um, scholarly content, um, licensed and opened, uh, research data, as well as web content. Lots of different file formats out there to consider. Um, images, videos, audio, text, drawings, structured data. Um, and it's important, to, if it is possible, indicate the range of the types of data as well. Um, we all know that software changes rapidly. Um, in one program, you might be able to open the, something today that won't, you won't be able to open a year from now or even five years from now. Um, I know that we probably ran into that problem at the State Historical Society mm -hmm. um, with a number of old access databases. They created all these wonderful old access databases and um, did all this work, and they put in a lot of work and a lot of resources into these records, um, and now we they never kept up on updating and moving um, it from different platforms, um, and that information is just unusable now, which is sad because there's lots of great uh, information in those old databases. So um, in your inventory, it might be very helpful to know what specific software program is needed to read that file. So why is date important? Well, um, the life span, the, everything has a different lifespan. We all know paper will last a long time if it's kept cool and in a dry place. Um, there's million year old or not million, but there's uh, thousands of year old um, Egyptian tablets that are still readable today mm -hmm. if you understand that language. Um, there's a reason we still microfilm a lot of things is because it, that no, that format 
um, will be able to be read. Even without a reader, you can still read it with you, as long as you can magnify it in some way. Um, and we know the analog is actually better. <laughs> exactly. However, we're moving forward, and less and less people are going to uh, going to uh, creating documents in analog. Mm -hmm. Newspapers aren't created in analog format anymore. No. It's all done digital. <laughs> so we have to take that digital record and put it on microfilm to preserve it. Preserve it. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Um, digital files are another story. They just don't last as long, and they're hard to predict how long that digital file is going to stay viable, which is why it's important to put the date of the inventory as well as the date of when that file was created and when, when the date was converted as well or received. So let's talk about location. Where in your institution is all of this location, all of this digital content um, kept. Um, I know at the State Historical Society we have a number of different servers and a number, number of different um, buildings, which is great mm -hmm. for, um, for uh, um, disaster recovery because mm -hmm. if one building is hit, I know that there's a copy of something on a different server it's in, in elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, it also makes it a little bit difficult to know, okay, this database exists on this server, but this database exists on that server, and, and, and that's why it's important to um, understand where your information is located. So this inventory becomes important so that you can keep track of where your data is and that um, it doesn't accidentally get deleted or forgotten about um, as well. And some, and some things are just more stable than others. Uh, I see there's a, a floppy disk right there in the center. Yeah. I, I, how I many still can, have them. Do you still well, have them? I don't can't use them because I don't have, actually, I, I had know. two. Because personally, I have, you know, because you know, that's what I used when I was in school yes. and for my resume when I was first looking yes. for a job. And in order to get some of the information out off of, off of that, I actually had to buy a separate external um, disk drive for yes. my computer at home because computers now aren't sold with them. They're not sold so, with them. Um, but that's the thing, too. I had to take and, it and copy it off onto a flash drive, like that and, cool little one. Yeah, <laughs> that little one um, is kind of cool. Um, and, and, you know, it also goes to, you know, CDs as well. I mean, CDs mm -hmm. used to be the, the go-to way to preserve your yeah. images. But the but where what we're finding is, is, you know, CDs are becoming less and less common. People are moving towards flash drives mm -hmm. and to um, the external drives because it's much easier to store things on those external drives or moving away from CDs. We do have a comment from someone who said that they have a few of the flash drives that do keep a reader for patrons. Yeah. Because they may have the same situation, too. They've got the disk and, oh, what do I do now? I need what was on here. Yes. That's a good idea. Have something just in case. Yes. Um, our poor, uh, uh, we, well, we have a new... Um, IT person, and I haven't actually at, yet asked him um, um, about uh, how we're going to go about reading some of our obsolete media. <laughs> Don't want to scare him away. <laughs> <laughs> because we get, we get in boxes um, from, from toners and things, and they probably have wonderful information on these five and a half inch floppies. Oh, Remember yeah. those? Um, and even if the, the data isn't corrupted, we have no way of reading it to check to see if the data is still viable or not. So... Um, and even like um, the Amazon cloud, which is a lot of people are moving toward cloud storage, um, you know, I think that's great because it's almost unlimited. However, um, I, I'm a control freak. Yes, that's <laughs> an issue that some people have. Do you want to give up your control to them? I mean, yes. if they go down, if something happens there, yes. you're, you're, not, you're out of luck yeah. until they can fix it or... Exactly. It is, and this is the thing, too, the cloud being new, it's great that you, it, what it does, but that you're saying technology changes so quickly. Is the cloud going to be the final and ultimate place? Who knows? You know, <laughs> and that's just it, is we need to continue to um, remain on the top of our game, remain being flexible and open mm -hmm. to new ideas and searching out um, things like these webinars so that we can keep up with uh, these new ideas and new models and, 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 and so that... The, this um, this depot training is really just to get you thinking about this. And it's not telling you to, well, these, this is the steps. You do this, you do this, you do this. What it's telling you is these are the things you need to think about 
so that we can move forward and make sure that we are preserving these items. Um, and we'll talk more about these different um, locations and the cloud later on in the other um, ones, um, especially when we get to the store con um, levels. <clears throat> so um, when you're thinking about, uh, when you're noting the location on your inventory, um, think about the method uh, to specify online or offline locations. Um, the general location. Um, going back to the method of location, um, some things are online, some things are offline, and then um, not some things are accessible to everybody and some things are accessible to just the public or to just certain members of the staff as well. Um, so you might want to consider that too when you're talking about locations. Uh, and uh, when, if you move something, remember to update it on your um, inventory. Uh, as well as note the, the new location. Um, just be clear without going to extremes. Um, you may just need to note that it's on server A um, rather than it's on server A in file C um, on drive. No. Um, so to um, uh, sum up the identify module, is that uh, you'll find that tracking stock and uh, identifying the digital content that you have will not only help you in the future, but it also will help you identify resources that you may need, such as funding, staff, and training. Um, and it will also help you validate, val uh, evaluate the tools you'll need in the future, um, whether, it's whether it's a policy related or um, as specific submission to, uh, submission to agreements. Um, like you might need to, um, uh, for museums or archives, you might need to think about um, editing your donation agreement, your deed of gift, or um, specific digital tools that you'll need to convert digital formats into new formats as well. Okay, so um, before we move on to select, was there any questions about um, about identify and creating a um, inventory? If you have any questions, go ahead and use the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface, and you can type in your questions. I'm seeing them here, as I did with that comment earlier, and you can um, pass them on. I can't tell if people are typing. I know until something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we do have a question from him. Um, I was told that the gold discs are best for storage. Oh, you mean the gold CDs? Um, mm. Yes, the gold CDs um, should have they 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 are advertised having um, some are advertised of having a shelf life of a hundred years, mm. or they're ha they have a uh, um, shelf life of five hundred years. My question to you is. That is are are you going to have a piece of equipment to read that disc in? 100 years or five years <laughs> because, um, you know, I think CDs are going out the door quickly, um, in, in my opinion. So um, while they might, your, your information will be safe on those gold CDs, my question is, are you going to have something to read that gold CD? Or are your predecessors going to have, be able to read things on those CDs? I know when I uh, walked into the, the, the digital imaging lab or into the photo archives, um, I found a box of floppy disks. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? Or a bunch of tape backups. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? I don't have any way of reading what these are on. So, you know, they're still sitting on my shelf because I apparently make a good bookend. <laughs> so um, well, that's, that's my opinion of, of gold CDs. to take into consideration is, yes, the gold CD will last a long time, but you have to also, if you're going to have that be your ultimate way of keeping the information, is you have to also can, uh, make the commitment to keep the piece of equipment that will read it as well. So my suggestion, yeah, yeah. I mean, what what happens is we migrate the data. We, we migrate right. the data from media form to media form. So um, the thing, this digital images that used to be stored on our gold CDs at the Historical Society now have been moved to a server that has um, it's a dual server that I don't even I sorry I'm not a 
IT person, but it's one of those RAD servers that automatically backs itself up and you already it duplicates itself as it as it serves and things and so that <laughs> that is you know we've moved away from the CDs already. Um, not that they aren't safe, but just because our information is so. Um, Right, this is great, thank you. Okay. All right, so I don't have any other questions? No, it doesn't look like it at the moment. Okay. So uh, why do we need to select the content that we're going to preserve? Well, as time goes on, storage has gotten cheaper and cheaper. Um, and power the management of di uh, digital content, content is not cheap. Uh, especially over the long term. It is a commitment of staff and resources. Not all digital content may be worth, uh, may be, uh, worth preservation, um, may be preservation quality. If you have a high resolution scan of your photos, um, do you really need to preserve the low quality versions of those scans, like I talked about earlier? And the idea behind long term preservation is that you will be able to make uh, this content available uh, at some future point, um, is that is that manageable? Giving uh, management manageable given the type of content that you are preserving. Also, the selection process for digital content is uh, very analogous uh, to the selection process of non-digital material. You don't collect material in your archive that doesn't match your mission. And you should keep those same principles in mind when you are. Um, selecting your digital content. So when we're talking about selections, I think we all um, know what we're talking about. Um, in, in the archives, we talk about appraisals and, and, and scheduling and libraries of selection. Museums, we talk about um, acquisition. We all might call it different terms, but we're all heading towards the same thing. We're determining what portion of that digital content is important enough to your institution um, to take on that responsibility of preserving. So the steps to deciding what con digital content you're going to preserve are very similar to the steps that you taught that were that you talk about when we would talk about your physical content. You're going to review the um, potential digital content just like we would review a potential do, um, uh, uh, donation. Uh, and then we're going to define and apply our selection, uh, selection criteria. Um, we have, for our, we have uh, collection uh, manuals and collection um, uh, material to help us define what's going to be collected and preserved. Um, and then we also know that once we make that decision, we're going to make that make sure that we implement the implement our decisions so that it is preserved over time. So how do we prioritize our selection pro process? Again, this process is very similar to your non-digital material and it, and it should be similar to your digital uh, and should be similar to your digitization <laughs> selection process. Um, what's significant, what's extensive, what gets the most use and the most requests, what might be the easiest content to preserve, what's the oldest and what's the newest, uh, what are you required to preserve, what might be at risk. Some formats um, become obsolete a lot faster than other formats. Um, PDFs are viable for a really long time. Video files, however, get old very quickly. So you need to consider all of these things when you're making, when you're setting your priorities of what, what you're going to preserve or what you're going to put your most resources into. Uh, so creating explicit cr um, criteria for the selection, uh, selection makes it possible to do more systematic and consistent, and to be more systematic and consistent with your selection process. Maybe you have uh, an existing collection development po uh, policy that may be adapted to include digital content. There may be um, a review process that you may want to implement, and maybe some of your materials will also will always be preserved. Maybe you want to evaluate how significant that material is and how unique it is, whether and 
um, whether it's preserved um, elsewhere. Your selection criteria will depend on your institution, your needs, and your resources. We did have a question come in. Yes. What is uh, the POS or PDS? PDS. PDS. Yeah, from the previous. Go ahead. Let's see, PDS. Did I misspeak? Maybe I maybe you misunderstood me. PDF. I think I said. Oh, PDF. PDF. Yes. I bet it's I. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably. Sorry. That you Not PDF. It. Yeah. PDF. Yeah. PDF. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I'm from Minnesota, so <laughs> sometimes my F sound like S's. I apologize. <laughs> All right, so there's a few other things to consider as well. Um, does your content have long-term value? Um, and, and, and if you answer no to any of these questions, you should stop. <laughs> does it have uh, a long-term value? Does it fit your scope? Is it feasible for you to preserve that content? And is it, make, is it possible to make this content available in the future? Um, so if you're offered a collection that is restricted until the end of time, is it really worth your restricted that nobody can see it? Is it really worth taking that collection on mm -hmm. if you can't make it available to your patrons um, at some point in the future? Um, so you should have, like, if it is a restriction at, uh, that has an end date, a specific end date, too. Go ahead, try again. Okay, there, there we go. go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about this uh, management of the selection project. Um, treat the selection as an ongoing structural project to plan and coordinate. Um, so this is not something you're going to do yourself. You should uh, talk to lots of different people, specifically the creators of the um, items you're trying to preserve, whether it's a database or, or somebody's metadata. Um, or somebody's digital image files. Um, contact those creators and work closely with them. So uh, come prepared when you, when you do talk to them and um, identify with them um, a list of materials to review um, and send reminders before the meeting, document the results and send them a copy as well. Okay, here is a question that came in. Is there a resource we can turn to to identify which format has the best life expectancy? For example, to know that a PDF is a better option than a Word doc, or to know if PNG would be better than PR2, or is there some guide, I guess, maybe is the question, to what is best? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's a specific guide out there. Um, I do know that there's good information um, through the Library of Congress's website, as well as the National Archives website. I don't know mm. for librarians if there is as well. Um, and I guess just going out there and keeping up and, and, and listening to the buzz. I know right now in digital imaging specifically, they're talking about TIPS versus um, JPEG 2000, and, and it's really... Um, <laughs> He said, she said at this point. <laughs> um, so I don't know if there's a specific one. I might have to do a little research and get back to you. Um, my email and telephone number is at the end of this program. So. Yeah. Oh, sometimes I refer them to the standards by the Library of Congress, right? Yeah. yeah. They have stuff. Yeah. And I actually just did add the Library of Congress, the, the, the depot webs that you've been talking about, mm -hmm. the link to their, the, um, and I think there might be, maybe, yeah, on their, that website, definitely. Thanks. Great. Great. All right. So. Oops. Oops. Okay. Um, so, so you're going to be working with a number of people. Um, remember to, uh, that it's an ongoing structure pro uh, project, and with any sort of ongoing project, communication is the key. Um, make sure that every player knows their role and keep the content creators in the con concert, um, conversation. 
Um, so you might want to identify who it, on your team is going to be the best at certain skills. Who's got the best analytical skills? Who's going to be able to review and understand the content? Determine the relationships and significance of the data, of the digital content, um, and make sound, consistent judgments. And then who's going to have the better um, interpersonal communication, our skills? Who's going to be able to communicate those needs clearly and compellingly? Um, and this might just be the person who's going to go talk to the boss <laughs> to get you more funding, to get you exactly. more As servers. Say, the funders, the people who are going to give you the money <laughs> and the support to actually do this. You need yes. to effectively communicate with them. Yep. Yes, and and that might not be this, and that might not that might be the same person with the analytical skills, but it might not either. It should be that person who can. You might need that one person on the team. Uh, okay, oh, so Karen, um, we, so, uh, Karen Mayer from library. Um, here in Nebraska shared a link with us. I will add that link to our um, delicious account um, at the Library of Congress where they have their guidelines and standards, what we were talking about earlier. Thanks, Karen. Okay. And then who has the technical skills, too? Um, uh, we work in a museum, or I work in a museum. Um, so we work with old things. So new things scare us. <laughs> Uh, so there's more. So, but some different people have better skills with other, uh, better other skills than other skills. So, um, when you're building your team, think about who on staff has all of these, or who would have these skills. They don't have to have all of these skills, but maybe it's one person. A collection of people could end up. Collection those, of yes. things. <laughs> We're talking about collaborations and and things like that too. So. Documentation. I know that um, whenever I talk to researchers or students, I always say document, document, document. You can never have too much documentation, right? Um, so supplement your inventory um, with descriptions. Um, it doesn't have to be item level, but it should be enough to specify categories. Uh, and then how much of that content is there and, and will there be, um, and use, who, um, when is this content no longer active? We talked about restrictions, and that's just kind of one example for that. Um, things go out of date pretty fast, you, you know, um, and every once in a while we have to purge those um, technical hand, handouts mm -hmm. when that, as um, information becomes obsolete. And then um, everybody's favorite topic in mind, who has the rights to these? Um, we might have the rights to preserve them, but do we have the rights to publish them and um, give other people the rights to publish them too? Um, so you need to document who owns those rights, whether it be your institution or if they're um, in public domain. So a few other things to con con um, consider. Does the content have long-term value? Does it fit within the mission of your organization? Is it feasible for you to preserve that content? And how will you make it available? Um, so, uh, that's all I have for you today. Um, so I'm sure you have lots of questions. Uh, part two, we'll talk about storage and protect, and then part three, we'll talk about manage and provide. Um, there's my email address. It's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, but like I said, there's lots of other resources um, on that Depot website um, that you're going to provide a link to yeah. as well. So does anybody have any um, other questions for this first part? Type them into your question section on your GoToWebinar interface. And we can see them from here. Wait and see if anybody comes <laughs> up with anything at the last minute. Okay. It looks like we answered people's questions throughout, which is good. <laughs> Not a problem with that. Great. Um, but, yeah, there is Karen's email. If you do have any other questions for her about this part one, um, you can contact her via that. Um, and then, of course, join us on um, part two. Oh, we have some things coming through. <laughs> Um, for part two on February 20th and part three on March 6th, um, that will be um, held here, same 
same time here on our Encompass live show. So it doesn't look like anybody's got any urgent questions. Great. Then I think we will officially wrap it up for today. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. This is a great start to all of this, definitely, <laughs> to get us going on uh, what we need to do to just even think about, is this something we can do? Should we do? <laughs> what is it all about? And should I even come for the other two? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, but if you're not sure, this is a good way to start. And as I said, as we did today, the other two will be recorded too. So if you do decide, you know, six months from now that, oh, wait, now that thing, we are ready to do that. Something's come up. We've got something. You can, you'll can you be able to go back and watch these other sessions as well. So um, don't worry about that. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, Karen. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, for attending this morning. Um, I'm going to pop over here now to our Encompass Live uh, website. Oh, myself here. There we go. Um, so thank you for attending uh, this week's show. Um, as we just showed, our Part 2 and Part 3 will be coming up. Part 2 on February 20th in two weeks, and then two weeks after that, Part 3 on March 6th. So please join us for those. Next week, however, we're going to be doing something. Um, on our, our show will be about seed saving for libraries. Um, this is something that has been um, a big topic um, in the last year or two. I've seen a lot of libraries doing this. And there was just, I believe, last week an NPR story about it, doing <laughs> a way to save your library, um, if you think your library needs saving. Um, but it's just a cool thing to do is um, circulating seeds, heirloom seeds out to people who in your community, local gardeners, and then they can bring, when they grow, bring back the seeds. Um, South Sioux City Public Library is just one library here in Nebraska. It's not the only one who's doing this. And they do it via the Seed Savers Exchange. We're based out of Iowa, and they're gonna, we're going to have um, Dave Mixdorf from there and um, Brent Olson from the Seed Savers Exchange on to talk about doing this in your library, so how you can set up a seed seed growing or seed sharing program at um, in your library. So hopefully you'll join us for that. And um, Encompass Live is on uh, Facebook. So if you do uh, use Facebook and want to connect with us there, please like our page on Facebook and you'll get announcements of when we have new shows coming up, uh, when recordings are available. Um, we also announced when we're ready to show today's show. So if you're not able to register ahead of time, we remind you, don't forget, this is what we're doing today. So please do connect with us there on Facebook if you want to keep up with what we are doing um, on the show. Other than that, I don't see any last-minute urgency.